Hi, my name is Michael Andrew, and I'm going to be your host and instructor for about the next two hours. I'm going to give you a free tutorial on the Canon RP full frame mirrorless camera. If you are coming from another system or if you're an experienced photographer, check out the table of contents below. You can do a search going Command F or Control F, depending on which computer you're on. Find your keyword, hit on the time code, and that will take you to that specific point of the video. We spent a lot of time putting that together. If you are a beginning or an intermediate photographer, I have to give you a word of warning. I can definitely show you how to use this camera, but it is just one little piece of the pie. It's one part of the puzzle. And becoming a, a good photographer involves many different skill sets. When I started in 2003, we didn't have YouTube. And so I had to learn through trial and error. And I remember being so frustrated. I wanted to take the camera and throw it into this brick wall, just oh, as hard as I could. But I'm glad I didn't. I stuck it out and it took me two years of trial and error to find out the things I'm going to teach you. And what I learned is it's most effective to pre-visualize in your mind the image that you want to take before you take it, and if that's the truth, the camera is an extension of your brain. So as an instructor, what I'm trying to do is to load your brain with the specific tools that you need and then show you how to synergize and put them together to create whatever it is you saw in your mind's eye. That's my teaching style. I know it's not for everybody, but I've been doing this for 12 years now and I've been pretty effective at it in this tutorial is to give you one of those tools. It's the operation of the camera. And if you like what you see and you find it helpful, I would invite you to check out the Canon RP Crash Course. It'll be ready in a couple weeks. And in that course, I will take you through all these other skill sets, philosophies of use, and I'll show you how to synergize them to really just crush it in photography and video. So I'll put the link down below if you're interested. You can go to the blog, leave your name and your email address, and we'll reach out to you as soon as it's ready. So that being said, we have a tremendous amount of information to cover, so let's get started. Let's go over all the external buttons and ports so you know exactly what each does and you will know what I'm talking about later in the video. The most important button on your camera is the shutter button, and as on most cameras, this is a two-phase button, meaning it has two depths of activation. The first is a halfway depression, which you are going to feel as a spongy resistance. This is going to focus the image depending on where your focusing square is, in your viewfinder or on your monitor. Pushing it down all the way is going to take the picture. Take the time to train your finger to know the difference between these two positions. Behind and to the left of the shutter button, we have the MFN button or the multi-function button, which will allow us to pull up a sub-menu to access things such as ISO, drives, focusing modes, white balance. Behind and to the right of that, we have our main dial, which I teach my students to think of as their primary selector. And I'll explain this a little bit later. On the back of our camera, where our thumb would rest, we have the quick selector, which I teach my students to think of as the secondary selector. And this is going to make more sense in the exposure lesson. To the right of that, we have the lock lever, which when engaged will prevent us from changing settings on certain features. We'll talk about this in the customization of the menu. This button right here with the red dot is the start and stop button for video recording. The mode dial will help us to select different shooting modes, including video. The hot shoe mount is where we attach speed lights to our camera. On the far left is the power switch, which turns the camera on or off. On the front of the camera, we have the AF assist lamp, which can aid the focusing systems in very dark situations. On the opposite side of the camera, we have the lens release, which we will need to press every time we rotate a lens off of the camera body. On the back of the camera, we have our EVF, or electronic viewfinder, which has an automatic shutoff switch that saves battery power when we bring the camera to our eye. To the bottom left of it, we have the diopter adjustment, which will allow us to change the focus of the EVF for those of us who wear corrective eyewear. To the left of that, we have the deep menu button, which we'll be covering in depth later in the video. To the right of it, we have the auto focus on button, which is also customizable, and we can use it for back button focusing. To the right of it, we have the exposure lock or flash exposure lock button, which allows us to temporarily lock our settings in the PS or A modes. 
or when using flash. Below it, we have the focus point selector button when shooting, as well as the magnify button when reviewing images. The info button will allow us to toggle different sets of information during shooting or playback for our images. Below it, we have the directional pad, which we can push up, down, left, or right. It will help with navigating through different menus and selection options. In the middle of it, we have the set button, which is like an enter button when navigating the menus, but this also acts as the Q button, which stands for quick menu in our shooting mode. Below it, we have the play and delete buttons, which as you guessed, allow us to show the images we have taken as well as get rid of the ones we do not want. The articulating monitor is touch sensitive, which means it is incredibly fast to swipe through images, navigate the menus, as well as changing most of our shooting settings directly on the monitor. On the left side of the camera, under the gaskets, we have the remote control terminal, the microphone and headphone jacks, the USB and HDMI terminal. And on the bottom of the camera, we have our battery port, we have our SD card slot. New to the EOS R mount system are the R lenses, which have a control ring, in this case on the 24 to 105 near the front of the lens. This can be customized to change exposure or ISO settings in the deep menu. We also have a stabilizer on off switch as well as an autofocus manual focus switch. And there's also a lock switch on the other side of this particular lens. So that's an overview of the camera's external buttons and ports with an introduction of the names and a short summary of what they do. If you ever forget which button does what, just come on back and we'll go over it again. Now let's go into an overview of how to operate and control the camera. So let's talk about some of the basics of setup. First, we're going to put the lens on the camera. And something I need to point out is this little marker here is the equivalent of the red dot on the lens. And this is going to show us where to line up the cap when we take the lens off and we're not using it. Something else I wanna point out real quick is this is the lens cap from the 24 to 105 F4. So most lens caps will have this and it's going to tell you the size of the accessory to buy for your lens. So if you're buying a circular polarizer, for example, or other kind of filter system. There's thread mounts that you screw into your lenses. This is where you find that information in terms of what size. When we're ready to put a lens on, obviously, this is the 24 to 105. This red dot here is going to line up with this red dot here on the camera body. So when you're ready to go, you line those up. It's gonna slide in and then you rotate it until you feel this click or a lock. To take the lens off, the lens release button is on the side. You're gonna push that in and rotate it again to the red point and remove. We'll be talking about sensor care and sensor cleaning on the full crash course. Main thing is, is you wanna limit how long this is open because you can get sensor dust and it can affect your images. Next, let's talk about putting the battery in. You're going to have this LP E17 battery. I would definitely recommend getting at least one extra. It's not the largest battery in the world. And we have these four copper looking pins. Those pins are going to face towards the camera body as we put it in. So we want them towards the camera and that'll push and lock in. So I'm a big fan of the Extreme Pro SanDisk memory cards. This is a 95 megabyte per second card. The price on these has come down significantly, 64 gigabytes. The main thing you wanna be careful of on this is to get a class U3 card. There's a little symbol right here, it's kinda hard to see. That is a sustained data rate for 4K video recording, and that's going to make sure that your, your videos are going to record smoothly. If you just pick up a memory card and try to use it, you know, without knowing what it is, I get so many emails from people saying, hey, well, how come I'm, I'm not able to record 4K video? That's the reason. There's a little indicator here. It shows the, the notched corner on the top. So this is the direction it should go in. You're gonna push that all the way down until it clicks. And then you're gonna close the door. Some of you might be wondering what this is. This is a shoe for the ball head that I'm using. So this is a Bogan Manfrotto ball head. I have probably five or six of these because I love them so much. It's just a cheap ball head. A ball head allows you to rotate the camera in different directions and then when you're ready to lock it down you just tighten this and it holds it it's not there, there are some higher end ones that are far more expensive but this for me works most of the time so that little thing you saw on the bottom of the camera this fits into the mount and it locks it in and so once i do this very secure this is this is not going to easily come off and that's something you should consider when you're buying a tripod and a head is security and strength. If you spent a lot of money on your camera, it's, it's worth investing some, some money into a good tripod 
The good tripods will allow you to swap these out. And so when we do the video lesson on the crash course, I'll show you a fluid head and why it's different and why we use that for video. So obviously the first time we turn our camera on, we're going to be invited to dial in the proper date and time. I'm in the Hawaii time zone, so we don't have daylight savings, interestingly. There it is. Touch screen is very nice. Anytime you see these gray highlights around a box, that means we can touch on it. And the arrow keys typically re refer to the directional pad. The set button will act as a return or an enter button. And of course, we can pick the format as well. We're ready to go. And here we are. Lots of information on the information screen. Something I want to point out is the touch screen when we press the play button. This is going to be very familiar if you have a smartphone. It allows us to touch and drag. If we want to zoom in to an image, we can pull our fingers apart. We can zoom out even further than the image, and zooming out further will give us tons of images to look at. So we can go further, and even getting thumbnails. This is a very fast and easy way to navigate through the images that you've taken. Tap the shutter button to return to the shooting mode. Lots of information in here. It can be pretty intimidating, but the first exercise I want you to do as you follow along is practice pressing the info button. And by the way, I'm going to be on aperture priority mode. You see we get these help screens. This info button right here is going to toggle the kinds of information we see on the back monitor. And the, the back monitor is a mirror of what we see in the viewfinder. So as I push the information button, oh, camera's not level, histogram. Too much information, take it away. Now we have this black information screen. And then we're back to the regular shooting screen. So the truth of the matter is, this is going to allow us to control the kinds of information that we see. So let me walk you through what some of these are real quick. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna make the screen dark so we can see these guys a little bit better. Almost on every camera, in the viewfinder as well as on the back monitor, there's three sets of information you should always be aware of. This is your shutter speed, your aperture, and your ISO. Your shutter speed and your aperture are controlling how much light is entering into the camera. And in manual mode, we're going to control those individually. I'll demonstrate this shortly. Consider ISO as an artificial boost or gain of the light signal that is hitting the sensor. It has nothing to do with the amount of light hitting the sensor, it is a boost. In the top left-hand corner, we have our shooting mode. And in these brackets, we have the number of shots remaining depending on our camera settings, the quality of the image. We have this burst indicator. I'll demonstrate this when we do the sport shooting. And we also have the number of time that we can record onto the memory card that we're using. We have a battery indicator. This guy right here is our touch shutter. I'll be demonstrating that in the focusing lesson. This Q screen, very, very handy. And it allows us to access certain shooting information, but you'll notice over here, on this directional pad, we also have a Q and set button, which will allow us to access the same menus. So on this very information heavy screen, there's tons of stuff in here. Do not get intimidated. It's fairly simple once you learn it all. If you do not see a box around it, that means you cannot touch it to change it. And this is where the Q button comes in. You can press it there, or you can press it on the directional pad, either one. And you'll notice that now we have access to these menu items. And for each menu item that we ha have on the left and on the right, we have these options on the bottom to change them. So this first one I like to refer to as the auto focus clusters. We'll be talking about that in the focusing lesson. The second one determines the auto focus operation, whether it is a one-time focus or a repeated focus, which is better for sports shooting. Below that guy, we have our drive modes. This is what the camera does after we push the shutter button down all the way. You can see we have many options here. We have a single shot. We have a continuous high speed burst. We have a low speed continuous burst. We have a 10 second timer. The way this works is it's a 10 second timer. And at the end of those 10 seconds, it'll take multiple shots. So if you're doing a group photo and you're worried about people blinking, that would be the one to do. Have, have it set to four or five and hopefully you get you know, a shot where everybody isn't blinking. Let's turn it back to single shooting. Below the drive modes, we have our metering modes. We'll be talking about that individually in this course. 
Image quality has to do with how the camera is recording the file types to the memory card. On the bottom here, L, M, S, all of these refer to JPEG files, and we'll be talking about this a little bit in the menu section. You're going to see the number of megapixels, 26. We have the resolution, 6,240 by 4160. We have the number of images that we can take on our memory card in the brackets here. And if we go into the info, we can also choose raw format or a compact format, which is supposedly gives us about the same information, but the file sizes are not as large. I'm talking a little bit more about that later. As we scroll across, you're going to notice that the number of images changes, even though these are still full resolution. And we talk about this on my full crash course. This has to do with compression. It's a smaller size file that visually is almost the same. It's very difficult to see the difference unless you're like a professional pixel peeper. Very hard to see. So medium size, you can see the resolution changes. We have a more compressed file type. And we have small one, 6.5, small two, which is 3.8. If you're a pure beginner, I definitely recommend starting off with large, simply because it's easier to make images smaller if you need to, a lot harder to take small images and make them large without losing some resolution. We have our movie recording resolution. We'll be talking about this quite a bit. So we have full resolution, 1920 by 1080 at 60 frames per second. Then we have 30 frames per second. Then we have something called light IP, B, which is a different type of compression. It's a lot to go into, but we do cover this on the crash course, the smaller file size. And then we have 720 at 60 frames per second and 720 at 30 frames per second. So one of the things that's interesting about the RP is that we do not have 24 frames per second in standard full def. Flicker reduction essentially allows for the camera to detect when certain types of lights are flickering. We cannot see it with the human eye, but Certain sodium-based lamps, outdoor lamps, fluorescent lamps, sometimes they flicker and you can see it in your images when you play them back. Flicker detection essentially tells the camera to reduce the artifacts that we see in the changing uh, lighting conditions when the camera actually takes the picture. If you want to turn it on, this is where you find it. White balance, we'll be having a lesson on this. Basically allows us to dial in the specific color temperature of the light that we're shooting in. Picture styles, think of these as recipes where the camera is given instructions to maybe make it a little bit more you know, vibrant if you're shooting, let's say, landscape picture style. Or if you're shooting humans in portraits, maybe the flesh tones need to be a little bit more accurate. And so I like to think of these as additional recipes when the JPEG files are being made. For pure beginners, what I recommend is just start off with the auto or the standard. And if, as you get more advanced, if you want to come in here and tweak these, you can do so by pressing the info button and you can adjust your sharpness, your hue, your saturation, a lot of the details in, in the sharpness settings. There's three of them. I do not recommend this for beginning or intermediate photographers. Some videographers love doing this because they want to get the look right in a certain way, they wanna make it flat, and they wanna grade it later, that's a whole different subject. But the short answer is if you're just getting started, start off on auto or standard. Auto light optimizer is disabled in the manual and bulb modes, and this essentially adds a little bit of contrast to our JPEGs only. And then we have the ability to change the cropping or the aspect ratio of what we're shooting in. I typically just leave it on full for stills. Again, we can always crop it in post. My dad loves to shoot in 16 by nine for his camera. And let's change, let me change the, the settings so you guys can see this a little easier. What the cropping modes do. So it changes the aspect ratio. This is a square. So if you wanted to shoot for Instagram, you wanted to have that frame and see where it is. Or four by three, or cinema, 16 by nine. It changes the framing. There's a 1.6 crop. 1.6 crop on a full frame Canon is about the equivalent of APS-C sized sensors. So if you wanted to shoot with a smaller part of the sensor, that would allow you to do that. So if we continue to press the info button, we, I'm very close on the, this is the digital level and there are two parts to this. 
The first is in the center right here. This is the up and down tilting, up and down. And these sides refer to the side to side levelness. The side to sides are the ones that are pretty much more important for landscape shooting. That's the one you want to keep an eye on. And then we have the histogram. If you don't know what that is, we talk about that on the crash course. And if I continue to press the info button, we can get this shooting screen, which takes away the information. And if we push it again, we're taken to the what I call the black information screen. You'll notice that we have this gray cue, which means we can touch this to activate the screen and pull up the options to change everything. We can also access it by pressing the Q button over on our directional pad. So at the very top, we have our shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. You see how we get these little notifications as we're going through everything. It's trying to tell us what it does. I find this super annoying, and I'm going to show you how to turn that off in a second. The thing I wanted you to recognize is that when we are in this mode, there are multiple ways that we can change our camera settings. The orange highlight is telling us which one we're on. So if I rotate my main dial or my front selection wheel, we can change it this way. I can also rotate my rear selection wheel and it will also change it. And I can also double tap and open up this screen so I can touch and drag to make these big changes a little faster. It's very nice. It's very intuitive once you get the hang of it. So there are other times in the case of speed, you just want to come over and rotate your wheel. So these menus are driving me crazy. Let's turn them off. Come into the menu. It's going to be on the yellow wrench icon. So this thing called the feature guide, we're going to disable that because you'll be tripping over it. It'll drive you crazy. So now those little guys are not popping up. Let's talk about some of the other features in here. Exposure compensation or auto exposure bracketing. We don't see it in the manual mode. See how I change the mode dial? And it's, it's trying to show us in these images what this controls. Some of these are okay uh, when you understand what it's talking about, otherwise it's confusing. So we're gonna turn those off too. I will walk you through all that. It'll make a lot more sense in a minute. Coming back to the black Q screen, so here's our exposure compensation. We'll be talking about that in a second. Flash exposure compensation, which means that we're changing the brightness of our flash. We have our picture styles, white balance, custom white balance shift. Talk about that too. We have our auto light optimizer, our Wi-Fi function. We can customize our different buttons. We have our focusing clusters focusing mode, our metering modes, our drive modes, and our quality settings. Out here we have our battery life. We also again have the number of shots remaining. You're, you're gonna see similar stuff in the viewfinder. So we push the info button again. We have cycled through all the screens and, and that's how it works. There's something very important I wanna show you guys to customize types of information that you see. If you press your menu button, yellow tab, yellow icon, and we come in here, Shooting info display, fourth page, come in here, screen info settings. What this means is that we can determine which screen appears by controlling which of these has a check mark by it. So this was the first screen I showed you. That was the busy screen. We have our level histogram. We have our clean screen and our black information screen. We can take this a step further by pressing the info button and we can determine other sets of information in terms of where they appear, depending on that screen. Do you want the histogram or the level? So this is very customizable, depending on how you want to shoot. If this busy screen is too much, you can come in here and turn off some of that information. It's very nice. I love it. You can also reset it. We'll be talking about some of this stuff. The viewfinder display format refers to what we see in the viewfinder. Display one or display two. I like display one a little bit more. Display settings allow us to control how our viewfinder and our back monitor are working. So when we have this to auto, we're telling the viewfinder to use this sensor that when we pull the camera up to our face to turn off this back monitor as a power saving feature. So if I tap my shutter button, we're shooting, looking at the back monitor. Now we pull it up to our eye and it turns off. So sometimes if you're holding the camera, if you have your hand in front of this, You'll block it and you'll be like, why is my camera not working? That's what's happening is your, 
because you're blocking that sensor. So the display settings, auto basically means that the sensor is on. We can come and turn that off and the manual display is asking, do you want to use the viewfinder or do you want to use the screen? So this is good if you're using a gimbal and you have a piece of machinery that you're putting the camera on. Uh, sometimes it's better just to go screen so this won't turn off and this is how you change that. But for now we'll leave it on auto. Before we get into the shooting modes, I also want to demonstrate some of the information we see in the video shooting mode. You'll notice immediately that when we get in here, it goes into this aspect ratio where we're 16 by 9 again. Look at this camera icon up in the top left hand corner. What is that? This is going to allow us to determine the type of exposure control we have when we're shooting video. I almost always shoot on manual mode. We also have an HDR mode that allows us to capture more detail in bright light. For now, I want you guys to stick with the manual exposure, but even professionals will use the auto exposure in changing lighting conditions. So if they're going from indoor to outdoor rapidly, this can come in handy. For now, let's stick with manual, hit OK. Something that's kind of interesting in this movie mode, manual movie mode when you first turn to it is we get an exposure compensation icon. This allows us to determine how bright it is or not. The reason why we have this on is it's basically changing our auto ISO. So if you're using automatic ISO, that's what's going on. I prefer you don't for now till you understand what this is all doing and we lose that option. Some of the other features in here, we have servo AF, which means this is an automatic focus that's going to happen over and over and over again. We have our shutter speed, aperture, ISO. We can zoom in. We're talking about this in the focusing lesson. It's very handy. Look how 10x, very nice. And we also have the Q screen up here. So when we press the Q screen, we get a lot of the same information that we, we saw earlier. We have which shooting mode we have for video. We have our focusing clusters. We'll be talking about this in the video focusing lesson on this course. We have our movie resolution. Again, here it is. We have our 4K there. We have our volume controls. I'll be talking about this. I like to have it on manual, but you can see it's, it's showing us the strength of the audio signal coming in. Digital image stabilization is something I, I recommend to never turn on because it's going to degrade the quality of your video. We'll be talking about this on the main crash course and how to stabilize. Then we have our white balance. Again, our picture styles, probably more important for video. Auto light optimizer and a video snapshot, something I never use. Coming back out, if we continue to press the info button, we can get those options displayed. Pushing it again, same as last time. Histogram, balance, then we get the clean view, and then we get the Q view. Again, you can see some of the things in here have changed. We have our audio levels. So if I press the Q button, we get the highlights. For video shooting, I would definitely recommend turning this to manual. And what this does is it controls the gain of the sound coming into the camera. And I also strongly recommend getting a good microphone if you are doing any kind of serious video recording. If you leave this on auto, what's going to happen is the, the gain is going to fluctuate. So when it's quiet, the camera's going to turn it up. And when it gets loud, it's going to turn it down. And so when you have somebody speaking, there are these huge shifts in sound. And that is really annoying. The record level below this allows us to determine the manual setting for the gain. We never want to clip out where we see this red, these red dots here on the side. So I'm going to turn that down a little bit. And you should check this every time you're doing video recording with a new microphone especially. But keep an eye on this. Try to keep it, you know, in, in the range of the yellow. Red is bad. Come back out. Some of the other things that you're going to notice in here that are a little bit different is we have a wind filter. You can turn it off. I've never successfully used this in terms of noticing a, a huge difference when it's actually windy. There's other ways to do this. And then we have an attenuator, which if we turn it on, it dampens the sound. You see there's almost no signal. So if you're in a very, very loud shooting situation, you might want to turn that on. So you really got to make a lot of noise for that. There's our digital movie image stabilization, and then we have a resolution. So that is an overview of the information screens for both still shooting as well as video.
So now we're getting into the exposure control lesson. Exposure is the amount of light that hits the sensor. We can control the amount of light that hits the sensor with our shutter speed, which is basically how long, and how wide our lens will open. Those are the two main exposure controls, shutter speed and aperture. For this lesson, however, I want you to think of exposure as brightness, how bright or how dark an image is. So the mode dial, which is located right here on top of our camera, has all these different letters on there. Some of them are confusing. We're gonna clear this up right now. So the reason why sometimes I refer to the main selection dial as the primary selector is because if you hold your index finger up, number one, numero uno, primary selector. In the aperture, in the shutter priority modes, your primary selector is going to change the primary setting, aperture, finger. Main dial is changing our aperture. In the shutter priority mode, finger, main dial is changing the shutter speed. That's why I like to call the main dial the primary selector, but let's talk about aperture priority mode first. AV stands for aperture value. And what this means is, is that we dial in the aperture and the camera is going to adjust the shutter speed for us. I gotta point out some very interesting things here. So currently I'm shooting at an aperture of f5.6 and we'll talk about apertures on the full crash course. But you'll notice is that when I move my primary selector, my main selection dial, the aperture is changing. So the higher the number of the aperture, the more we are making that opening smaller and smaller. I'll do it out here. So this is a small number and this is a large number. So as we use a larger f-stop, the opening becomes smaller and smaller. Now you should notice something about this is you're probably thinking, Michael, if you're making the opening smaller, how come the image is staying the same brightness? It's a very, very good question. Even if we were to take pictures, the brightness would be about the same. So what's happening here is that as we adjust the aperture, the camera is making changes to the shutter speed that we can't see because the shutter speed is hidden. If you tap your shutter button, now we can see it. There it is. And so as we rotate our main control well, we're changing the aperture, the camera is changing the shutter speed to compensate. It's trying to get a balanced, even exposure. And if you don't have your camera by your, by the way, definitely get your camera and follow along. I'm going to show you some very important things here real quick. And now we're going to talk about exposure compensation. That's this little bracket right here to the right of our aperture. Think of exposure compensation as changing your brightness. So if we wanted to make the image brighter, we would push this and we can select one of these numbers over here to the right, take another picture, that is a very simple and easy exercise for you guys to do. Look at the difference between that and that. This was an even exposure and this was a little bit brighter. We can do it again. Look how bright the preview is getting. So that is how you take brighter images. Let's say we wanted to make it a little bit darker. Or we'd just go in the opposite direction. You'll notice we have a negative here and a plus here. We also have these signs over here. We could tap on these. Take another picture. And now it's darker. So that is how, that's the, probably the e, one of the easiest ways to change your image brightness when you're first getting started. I personally like to teach my students to use aperture priority mode because it's something that once you learn how to use it, you're going to be using it often. High-end professionals use aperture priority mode depending on what they're shooting. And, and there's reasons when I use either aperture priority mode or manual mode, the vast majority of my shooting are in those two modes. And so instead of using, you know, like dummy mode and the green mode and all this other stuff, I just say, try to learn aperture priority mode if you are comfortable enough. So aperture priority mode, let's talk about what is happening with this exposure compensation bar. We dial in the aperture. If we wanna make it brighter, let's put it on this one. 
And let's take a look at what happens to our shutter speed when we do that. So if I tap the shutter button, 1 60th of a second when it's at plus one, and when we're at the even home plate, it's 1 125th of a second. So what's happening here is that when we give the camera instructions to make it just a little bit brighter, that one refers to one stop of light. And what that means, that is going to be twice as much light as the previous zero. Okay, so take a look at it. Let's, look, let's do the math. One 125th, and we want twice the amount of light coming in. Now we're at 1 60th. So that is a very important thing to understand is that one stop of light is twice the amount as a previous setting. And in aperture priority mode, the camera is adjusting the brightness of the image by adjusting the shutter speed. What do you guys think it is on plus two? If you said 1 30th of a second, you're absolutely correct. And this is the heart of the matter with exposure compensation. We're giving the camera permission to make the image brighter by adjusting or shifting the shutter speed in one direction or another. So each one of these numbers is one stop of light and every little tick is one third of a stop. So we have some pretty precise control in terms of how bright or how dark it's going to be. Something else I wanna show you guys is a philosophy of use thing. We'll go, we go into a lot of this on the main course is I want you to take your hand and slowly bring it in front of the camera and watch what happens to the shutter speed. Tap the shutter button, and you can see that the shutter speed is changing. So what's happening here is the camera is constantly measuring how much light is coming into the camera. If it was to get brighter, we would see a shift in the shutter speed, and if it gets darker, the camera is gonna to try to go with slower or longer shutter speeds to compensate for this change or this shift in light. And that is the heart of the matter with aperture priority. We dial in the aperture and we're turning control over to the camera for the shutter speed. Now something that's also very nice about aperture priority mode, obviously, is we can change our ISO. Something I need to point out is that it, it's very helpful to keep an eye on your shutter speed depending on what you are shooting. If you are shooting people handheld, if you're holding this without a tripod, I recommend not trying or even attempting anything less than 1 60th of a second. And the reason is we move and people also move. Even if we're trying not to, if we breathe, we're, we're moving a little bit, probably to be on the safe side, maybe 1 100th or 1 125th of a second. That's a faster shutter speed. And that is going to minimize some of the, of the blur. It also depends on the lens and image stabilization and things of that nature. But I basically say for portraits, 1 60th of a second is the minimum shutter speed that you need. If you go longer, you could probably expect some blur. If you are shooting a running athlete, sports type shooting, probably 1 500th, 1 1,000th of a second. And now you're probably saying, but Michael, you can't change it. You cannot get it. What's going on here? This is going to happen to you. You're gonna be at a sporting event and you're gonna want that one 500th or that one 1,000th of a second and the camera's already maxed out. We're at our maximum aperture. What would you do in this situation if you needed to get that faster shutter speed? Think about it for just a second. If you said, bump your ISO up, you are absolutely correct. So the ISO is giving the sensor a boost to the signal. And because of that, we can afford to use a faster shutter speed. So this particular setting in this environment, 1 640th of a second, it may not be enough. You may need to bump it up more. ISO 6400. So now our shutter speed is 1,250th of a second. That's a very fast shutter speed for sports shooting. It's pretty good. So the trade-off with very high ISOs, let's just go all the way up. As you use higher ISOs, we introduce more and more noise. So if, uh, this is obviously exaggerated. You can see all the grain in the image there. That is very typical of higher ISOs. And there's gonna, going to be a limit in terms of which ISO is going to be the safest. So if we were to come back out and let's say, let's use a wider aperture. Let's turn our ISO way down. Obviously it's gonna be a longer shutter speed. We'll go something like that. 
And one hundredth of a second, if we were to play that back, look, almost no noise at all. And so that's the trade-off with ISO, is that it starts to introduce noise. So if you're a pure beginner, just getting started, aperture priority, take a picture at an even exposure, and then go out and take one with a plus one or a plus two, and then a minus one or minus two. If you just do that one exercise and you master it, you are well on your way to becoming a great photographer. So now that we understand how to change our exposure compensation, and we're doing this all on the back monitor, sometimes you're gonna be shooting through the viewfinder. Sports, for example. And this is why I like to call the rear selection wheel the secondary selector. We have our primary setting, we have our secondary setting. Primary setting is changing the aperture, and our secondary selector can directly change, I'm gonna tap the shutter button to make this work, exposure compensation directly. So as you're shooting, bam, 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 you're shooting, 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 oh, it's a little dark, let's make it a little bit brighter. That's all it is. As you're looking through the viewfinder, this will become second nature after a certain amount of time. And it's the same is true with most cameras, is that you can adjust your secondary setting and brighten it and darken it as you go. So real quick, we need to talk about the MFN button or the multi-function button. It's just behind and to the left of the shutter button on top of the camera right up here. The idea of this button is that we can designate it to do different things, especially as we're looking through the viewfinder. So as we're looking through the viewfinder and we can change our primary setting, we can change our secondary setting. What about our ISO? We don't wanna pull the camera away from our face, right? push the MFN button, there's our ISO control, and you can see that these little orange icons, one designates the forward or the front control wheel, the primary, and the back control wheel, the secondary. So the front control wheel is going to change the setting, and the rear control wheel is going to change the function. So here are our drive modes. If we wanted to change our drive modes, we could. We could change the focusing mode if we wanted to. We can change our white balance. We could change our flash exposure compensation. But for the most part, I like it on ISO because it gives me quick, easy access to changing ISO while looking through the viewfinder. So that is the purpose of the MFN button is to give you greater control while you're looking through the viewfinder. You should be able to change your shutter speed, your aperture, your exposure compensation, and your ISO all while looking through the viewfinder. Try not to become overly dependent on the cue screen and using these nice beautiful icons to change your camera settings. That's something that DSLR shooters have done for years and it keeps them in the action. It keeps them engaged with the subject instead of needing to, to pull the camera away from their face and change those settings. So keep that in mind. TV stands for time value, which is shutter speed priority. It's the opposite of aperture priority. And what this means is that we dial in the shutter speed and the camera is going to change the aperture. There it is, it's changing the aperture as we change our shutter speed to maintain an even exposure. Let's say we're out shooting a sporting event, and some people do use shutter priority for sporting event, and we need one one thousandth of a second. There it is. We start to see this, the camera's flashing, the aperture is very unhappy, this is the camera complaining. What would you do? Think about it. Right, bump up the ISO. Again, this, is, this may be the only thing you can do if you needed that one one thousandth of a second. So if you can just understand the aperture priority and the shutter priority and how it works with ISO, you are doing fantastic. Okay, you're well on your way. So the summary on this is that the camera is changing the aperture for us. With exposure compensation, the camera is making the adjustments to the aperture. We see right there, 4.0. If we turn it down, tap the shutter button. We're at 5.6. So that's the difference between aperture priority and shutter priority. So let's talk about the P mode or the program mode, which has a time and place. If you're just getting started and you're, you're intimidated by aperture priority mode, just go for, for the P mode. It's going to change most of the camera settings for you. We can even come in here and change our ISO to auto. And it's basically a point and shoot camera at this point, okay? However, there are some things you need to know about the program mode. Number one is that if you are doing event shooting and you have a speed light on your camera, which is a flash, P mode is the handheld flash mode. And what that, that means is the camera is going to use a shutter speed 
that is safe to use with your flash. If you use flash on aperture priority mode, sometimes you get some really long shutter speeds. And so, yeah, there's a time and place for program mode even for professional shooters who are using flash. The second thing about this is P mode means the camera is going to change both the shutter speed and the aperture. And when we're shooting like this, we don't know what those settings are. However, if we tap the shutter button, we can see it's giving us a safe shutter speed and a pretty general safe aperture. If we rotate our main dial, check it out. Now we can see that they're changing and it's starting to give us weird combinations. So if you're rotating your main wheel in the P mode, you might be changing those settings. And, and, and so if you're shooting at F9, 1 15th of a second, all your pictures are gonna be blurry. So the idea is to know those safe shutter speeds 1 60th of a second, for example, it's pretty good. Tap your shutter button, keep an eye on that if you are shooting on program mode. Exposure compensation works the same, although it may change it using a combination of shutter speed or aperture. If you're on auto ISO, sometimes ISO will be changed in order to compensate. But 1 60th and F4 is a good place to start. Next, I wanna talk about manual mode. I love manual mode because it gives us complete control over the camera. You'll notice both the shutter speed and the aperture are highlighted, which means we control everything. In the manual mode, there is no exposure compensation. We are responsible for all the camera settings. So my advice to pure beginners, aperture priority mode, it's okay to struggle with it. It's gonna be okay to fail with it because once you learn it, you're going to have a lot of firepower. Shoot with this when you are learning or you have a minimal amount of time. Practice with manual when you have the time and you're willing to experiment with your shutter speed and aperture. If you're doing event shooting with a speed light, you may consider program, or if you're just getting started, it's also a good place to begin. So let's talk about some of these other letters so they make sense. B stands for bulb mode. And the way this works is that when you push and hold the shutter button down, we get a clock in the bottom right hand corner, it starts counting. This is our new shutter speed. So as long as we hold that shutter button down, the shutter is open and then when we release it, the exposure finishes. It has some very handy uses. So let's talk about the C1, C2, and C3. These are our customizable modes, and they allow us to, to save certain settings on those positions, so they're there for us when we're ready. So let's say you're a sports shooter, you like shooting outdoors, you like to do it in aperture priority mode, maybe you like to have a certain white balance, the sun icon, Maybe you want a certain picture style, maybe you know flesh tones and portraits, whatever it is. So you can come in here and designate all these different settings, whatever they are. And then when you get it set up the way you want, you're going to come into your menu, yellow wrench tab, sixth page. We have this custom shooting mode. So once the camera is all set up, come in here, register settings under C1. And what's going to happen is the camera is going to remember those settings when you flip the mode dial over to C1, it's ready to go. You can see the aperture priorities changed. If we were to come into the Q settings, we could see some of these other settings, P mode, the servo, it's all there. Very powerful. That applies for many types of shooting styles. When we come back to this menu item, we can clear the settings and we can also select to update the set with enable and what this means is that if we're on C1 and we start changing some of our settings, it is going to remember those settings. So this is just personal preference. And if you screw it all up and you wanna reset it, you can do that too. But as you advance and as you become more skilled with your camera settings, you are going to probably have one or two of those set up. I like to have mine set up for portraits. Why? Because I like the portrait picture style. You know, I like to shoot aperture priority. There's things I know that every time I shoot portraits, those are the settings I want. So we have a couple other modes. We have the video mode. We'll be talking about that separately. We also have this scene mode, which allows us to pick these different scenes. Not a huge fan of these. I'm, I'm a bigger fan of learning the core skill sets. Canon's trying to make our lives easier by just, you know, picking what it is you're shooting and then they, they do all the aperture and shutter speed and all these you know, picture styles for you. The problem is, is it makes you dependent on this menu without really thinking about what you're doing. And when we come back to those settings, you're going to notice we don't have control 
over all these things that we wanted. We can press the Q button and we can change the mode, the focusing mode and the burst, but that's it. No exposure control. You know, we can change some of the things a little bit, but this is a dead end. There's very limited control in terms of what you can do. And if you learn the basics, you will not need these. There are, however, a couple very valuable scene modes. One of them is the silent mode. So if you want a completely silent shutter, listen. Just took a picture right there. Oh, excellent. Did you guys see that? I'm shooting with an LED light right now in my living room and you can see the banding. So what happened on silent mode is that this is an electronic shutter only. It means there's a physical shutter that opens and closes under normal conditions. And in a silent mode, what happens is that shutter remains open. It never closes. I'm, I'm glad this happened. So when you see this banding, this is an artifact of shooting with an LED light. And the way you get around that is you shoot with a normal shutter. So if we come back to aperture priority, watch the mechanical shutter. No problem. So that's something you should be aware of if you see it. One of the other modes in here that's pretty nice, there's a couple HDR modes. The HDR backlight control, I'll be demonstrating this on the full crash course. Those are handy if you are not dealing with a moving subject. They, they have come in handy for me. There's also a night handheld scene that's going to stack four consecutive shots. And then we have basically a long exposure mode with flash. But the two gems in here are the HDR backlight control, the silent mode, and maybe possibly the handheld night scene where it's going to take four consecutive images. Other than that, it's kind of a dead end. The A plus mode, the green mode, which I lovingly refer to as the dummy mode. This turns your camera into a point and shoot. Camera takes away pretty much all the control. Even if you push the Q button, all it gives us is filter controls, background blur. This is another dead end, in my opinion. <laughs> you can make it, you get some brightness control. Because I don't like this because it's taking away the opportunity to learn how to really control the camera. And so I say this is a dead end. You can change, you know, your quality settings and, you know, your drive modes. But you didn't spend this kind of money to shoot it as a point and shoot. You have a phone for that. The size of the sensor on the RP is amazing. Take full advantage of it by learning how to control the basics of photography. And so dummy mode, I say stay away from it. So let's talk about the FV mode or the flexible priority mode, which came out with the EOS R. It's a new Canon shooting priority mode. And I think it's confusing. It's, it's sort of like the program shutter speed, aperture priority and manual modes had a love child altogether. Okay. And this, I, I think Canon's trying to make it easier. And I actually know people who love it, but it's confusing if you don't know what these numbers are on the bottom or how to change them. The way it works is you'll notice this little orange icon. That is what our primary or our main selector wheel is going to change, right? So we can change our shutter speed, great, keep shooting, great. But if we wanted to change our aperture priority, we could, we could rotate that now, we can change our aperture. So this is kind of like manual mode, is we're just changing each of these settings. Pretty straightforward, right? So the idea on this is that we could push up on our directional pad or to the right and turn that into an auto setting. So now the camera is going to do the lifting for auto. This would be the equivalent of manual with auto ISO. But if we wanted to change it, we could again. But let's say we wanted our shutter speed to be auto, okay? Now it's auto, you can see the, the line underneath it. And we would be shooting essentially on aperture priority. And so that's kind of how it works is you can just designate which one you want to change or not. You can still come in and touch, change all these guys, things of that nature. But in the end, your primary selector is easier to remember with your primary mode. Aperture priority is going to be changed with your aperture. And that's why I recommend just sticking with this. It's going to be easier. So in conclusion, those are all the modes and how to operate exposure control in each of them. We covered a lot of territory. It's a great skill set to have. So let's talk about 
white balance real quick. I hope you guys saw it when I was tweaking those settings on the custom settings. White balance is basically the camera's way of knowing the temperature of light that we're shooting in. And there's a lot of confusing things going on here. If you are intimidated, start off with auto white balance and just learn exposure. What will happen eventually is you'll take a picture and the color will look off. It'll look a little blue or may look a little bit yellow. And our eyes are extremely good at changing to different types of light sources. Camera sensors are not. And sometimes we have to tell the camera what kind of light we are shooting in. And that's where white balance comes in. Auto white balance is pretty good on Canon cameras. I think it's among the best. And we have two flavors of auto white balance. If we push this guy, we can choose a more white priority or a more ambient light priority. And we can't see a difference here because it's so close. But either one of those two are going to be pretty good to start. However, when you start to see color being off, it's probably going to be worth it to select the icon for the type of the environment you're shooting in. So let's go through each of these real quick. We have the sun icon, which is daylight. You see how it turned yellow? We have the shade icon, even more yellow. We have cloud cover, tungsten light. Look how blue it is, crazy. Fluorescent light, it's almost like a purplish. We have flash, we have custom white balance, and we have our Kelvin white balance, which is really handy if you know the temperature of lights you're shooting in. So I know this is a lot of information. The gist of it is select auto white balance if you need to adjust, but let's talk about custom white balance. You can see the colors changed here. Custom white balance is great when you are shooting in an environment that has multiple light sources. Maybe it's the sun, maybe you have a tungsten light, and a fluorescent light all in the same place, okay, or some shade, and you're getting some weird results like this. So the way custom white balance works is you take a picture, in this case these white blinds, and we're going to tell the camera this is white. We come into our menu, we're going to go to our red tab, it's going to be, here it is, custom white balance. We're going to say this is pure white. I've used tablecloths, I've used walls, I've used ceilings, I've used pieces of paper. We're gonna hit set, use this for the custom white balance. There it is, tap the shutter button, and you can see that the white balance has changed. This is pure white now, and we're good to go. So let's talk about Kelvin real quick. We talk about this in depth on the full crash course. There's a philosophy of use section to try to conceptualize the short answer on this is we can change our Kelvin by pressing the cluster button or by pressing this guy right here. When we use a very low Kelvin setting, you can see the camera is going to turn blue. When we use a very high Kelvin setting, you can see it's going to turn yellow. What the camera is trying to do is trying to counteract the color temperature that we're shooting in by adding different colors. We're, again, I don't want to confuse anybody, but if you know the temperature of the light source you're shooting in, you can dial this in, and it should be close to perfectly white. There's a great section on the course where we go into a lot more detail on this. Something else I need to point out on each and every single one of these white balance settings is that we have the ability to do color shifting. This is something that I would not recommend for beginning or intermediate photographers, but we have blue, green, amber, and magenta. And what this does is it allows us to add a little bit of color in each of those directions. So sometimes you'll get a light source that's kind of a little funky and you'll say, man, that looks a little bit green. You would come in and you would add some magenta. You can also bracket these to take multiple images with blue, green, and amber. I hardly ever use it. Let's talk about our camera's metering modes. And this is how the camera is measuring light coming into the camera. So if we tap shutter button, we can see it changes up. How is this happening? The way it works is the camera looks at different parts of the viewfinder to get light information. So if we hit our Q button and we open up our metering modes, we have this, these four on the bottom here. The evaluative is a good place to start. You know, if, if you don't know anything about it, it's measuring essentially the whole screen. It's looking at a bunch of different things, but the way to explain this 
is to talk about the spot metering mode. This guy right here. So we're going to select that. And when we come out, you can see that we now have this little circle on our monitor. Take a look at the shutter speed, 1 one hundredth of a second, as we move it over this headlamp that I put on a tripod. 1 200, oh, 1 one thousandth. So it's recognizing that the headlamp is a very bright light source and it's changing the exposure settings based on the light within that circle. The moment we get it outside of that circle, what's happening is the camera's looking at the circle and saying, hey, it's not as bright. You're going to need a slower shutter speed. And that is the heart of the matter with metering is we're, we're telling the camera to look in these different places with spot metering mode. This is one I, I'll sometimes use if I'm shooting into backlight and I have a, a portrait, for example, and there's lots of light coming in in the corners. I'll just tell the camera, hey, look right, right in the middle there. Otherwise, the evaluative is great. Partial metering looks at a little bit of the center and a little bit more of the outside. And then we have center weighted, which is essentially like a larger spot circle in the middle. Let's talk about our camera's focusing systems. This can be very intimidating. We have 4,779 phase detection points. We have two different focusing modes and we have six different focusing clusters. The easiest way for me to break this down is to tell you to think about this in terms of the how, the when, and the where. How, when, and where. If you think of it in those terms, this is going to be a lot more easy. So how does the camera focus? The default for most cameras is a halfway shutter button depression. So we push a shutter button halfway down that typically engages the camera's focusing systems as well as the metering. When we push it down all the way, it takes the picture. That's the default for most cameras. We have some additional ways we can focus with our RP. One of them is with this AF on button, thumb button. This is also referred to as back button focusing, and I'll talk about a customization for this near the end of this lesson for focusing. We also have this wonderful touch monitor that we can touch almost edge to edge. We're telling the camera to focus in these different places. This is designated with these green boxes and the beep. Every time we get a focus lock, that's what this is telling us. We also have this feature here, which is touch shutter. If this is turned on, it'll also take a picture after it focuses. I usually turn that off because it drives me crazy. And when we're interacting with a monitor and you're trying to change settings, this will often, you know, just start firing away. So I turn that off. So that is how we focus halfway shutter button depression, thumb button, or with a touch monitor. Let's talk about when the camera is focusing. That's the second feature right here. One shot or servo. One shot is exactly like it sounds. It means the camera is going to focus one time. So if I was to demonstrate this, we're using this target here. If I push the shutter button halfway down, the camera gets focus lock. And if I move my focusing square off the subject, the camera will not refocus. This is also referred to as recomposing. So I get a focus lock change the composition of my subject, push a shutter button down all the way, and it'll take the picture. Very handy, all photographers should know how to do this. It works better with, you know, apertures that aren't too wide, so like 2.8, you might pull the subject out of focus, you know, 1.8 definitely, but for shooting at, you know, f5, f5.6, you can lock and recompose. It's very handy technique to know. The second one in here, servo, means the camera is going to focus over and over and over again. It is a continual focus, not a one-time focus. It's over and over. So when we use the target, if I push a shutter button halfway down, now we get these blue squares. And as I move the camera towards these blinds, it's refocusing on the blinds now. This is a continual autofocus where the camera as long as we are engaging the focusing systems, it is going to be searching for a new focusing point. It's not, can't really recompose in the servo mode. And this mode is better for sports shooting. Why? Because we have moving subjects and their distance and position is constantly changing. 
and this allows the camera to constantly update where the focal plane is. So when does the camera focus? It's either a one-time focus with one shot, or it's a continuous repetitive focus with the servo mode. Next, let's talk about the where our camera is focusing. This has to do with what I refer to as the focusing clusters. These are different groups of our focusing points working together. The easiest and most straightforward one, I think, is a single AF point. So when we select this, and we come back to our main screen, you see we have this single square. Pretty straightforward. It's just one little box and we're telling the camera to focus on this one point. Now something about this that is interesting is that we get some additional options when we push this little button right here near our thumb. This is actually the cluster button. And when we push this, you can see that we get a number of different options. The garbage can icon or this button would change the center position of it. So if we're not centered and we push the garbage can, it's going to jump back to the center. We can also push the MFN button to get direct access to these other features from here if we wanted to. And we also have the ability to zoom in and see what we're focusing on. Let's turn this back to one shot. So we can zoom in and see if we got focus. We can also use one shot with our magnified mode, even at 10x. That's a very nice feature if you're trying to get precise focus lock. It's the magnifying tool right there. Let's take a look at some of these other clusters. Here's spot AF, which is a very small square. We can recenter that as well. There it is. We can also zoom in and engage focusing as well. That's a smaller square. Macro photographers are probably going to love that. Let's take a look at some of the others. Expanded area AF is probably good for sports kinds of things. It's basically giving the camera permission to look around that central square. We're expanding the area just a little bit. Slightly larger. And then we have the expanded AF area around, which is going to be even more. And then finally have the zone autofocus, which is going to be using a larger square. So as you can see, as we go from pinpoint, single square, expanded area around, and zone autofocus, we're basically getting a larger and larger area. So the idea with tracking, if we have this mode and we do not have a human face, we touch on the subject we want it to follow and it figures it out. And when you have high contrast, this can work really well. But if, if it disappears and then it comes back, it, it can be tricked sometimes. It's doing a pretty good job right now. A lot of this is going to depend on your background, but the idea is that this is going to follow your subject around. And obviously, if it's moving, we'd probably want it on servo, right? There it goes. In a perfect world, it would never lose focus lock, but the truth of the matter is it doesn't always do a great job. So now let's talk about using the face and tracking mode when we have a face out there. See that little face icon? So the idea on this is the camera would be able to detect a human face, and when we engage the focusing systems, it would be able to jump on it. Right now we're on servo mode as designated with the blue box. Now with the Canon RP, we have a new feature that is amazing, and that is eye detection. You can see it right here. It says info eye disable. If we come in here and we turn that to enable, it should recognize one of my eyes. There it goes. This is size dependent. If, you, if the box gets too small, you can lose that eye detection. However, if you are shooting with wide aperture lenses, we're talking about you know, 2.0 or wider, 1.8, this is a gold mine of a feature because when we shoot portraits, we always want one of the eyes of our subjects, at least one, to be in focus. And there it is, it's, it's getting focused with the servo. Let's see on one shot, we see that green box. This is a wonderful feature because it's working in both single shot, as well as servo. So if your subject's moving around, it still should be able to track and shoot. It's a great 
wonderful new feature, especially for portrait photographers, and that is referred to as eye detection. If we come into our red tab, page seven, we also have a lot of these features in there. Here's the eye detection. We can turn it off here. Real quick, continuous autofocus. Think of this in terms as a pre-focus. I think it's a good idea to leave it to disable because if you turn it on, the camera is going to be searching and hunting around. I, I don't think it's a great feature. So here it is looking, and I'm not even touching the camera. It's just doing it all by itself. I think it's gonna frustrate you and wear your battery out. Touch and drag autofocus settings. We need to discuss this real quick. A lot of DSLRs have a joystick where they can move the focusing squares around. We have a touch monitor. And when we're looking through the viewfinder, the touch monitor can become the new joystick. So if we come in and we turn this on to enable, this is going to allow us to use the touchpad as a joystick so we can move our focusing squares around and we can even designate what part of the monitor we are using. This is very important if you are left eye dominant like I am. So if my left eye is looking through here and my nose is touching the screen, which it often does, it bumps it, I wanna be using the bottom right hand part of this touch screen, there it is, to move my focusing points around. If you are right eye dominant, you could probably use the whole right side right here. Or if your nose doesn't touch, you may be able to use uh, all of it, you know, the whole thing. But this allows us to designate what part of the monitor we're using to change our focusing square. Um, again, I'm left eye dominant, so I'm gonna use the bottom right. And looking through the viewfinder, I can move the focusing squares around by touching on this monitor. We also have the ability to change the focusing square by the relative position as we touch and drag or the absolute position, personal preference. It's kind of hard for me to show this to you because I have to be looking through the viewfinder to in order for this to work. So often I get questions about back button focusing. It's more of an advanced feature for people who like to shoot sports. A lot of high-end sports shooters use it. Back button focusing is this guy right here. And the way to really take advantage of this is to turn off the focusing mechanism for our halfway shutter button depression. And we can do this if we go to this black screen and we come into our, our button customizations. And here's the shutter button right here. Come in here. There's the autofocus and metering. If we turn it to metering only, the autofocus will not be engaged with a halfway shutter button depression. It will only be, be engaged with the AF on button and hit OK, otherwise it won't remember it. So as a quick example for back button focusing, let's say we have a running athlete and I'm focusing on him and he stops and I want to take his picture, but I also want to recompose it. Back button focusing will allow me to do that. All I have to do is lift up the, the AF on button. I can recompose. The focusing is not going to change. I can shoot all day long. And this focusing square may be on the background now. That's a pretty good reason. And if we had it for a halfway shutter button depression, watch what happens. We get focusing lock on a servo mode. And then as we recompose, the focusing square would jump to the background and the focus would change. And so that's one of the reasons why it's desirable for sports shooting. There are a couple other techniques I want to show you in this lesson. We'll go into it more, obviously, on the crash course. And one of them I refer to as manual zoom focusing. What I did right there is I flipped the lens switch from autofocus to manual. And as soon as you do that, you get this little distance rangefinder thing on the bottom telling you where the focal plane is in terms of meters. That's not what I wanted to show you. What I wanted to show you was this square that we can control and determine, zoomed in, that we can manually dial in our focus to make sure it's tack sharp. This is good sometimes for video. Zoom out and hit the record button. Very handy for focusing into space. It's one of the techniques I'll show you guys on that other video. And not only that, come into the menu, we have this awesome feature in here called peaking. So we turn that on. I like red.
Now you'll notice that we have this red outline around the tripod. Peaking essentially tells the camera to perform a color overlay in areas of high contrast, which is typically where the lens is focusing. If we zoom in, we lose that peaking. So keep that in mind, your camera is not broken. It's just a limitation of how this feature is implemented. But peaking allows us to visually see, get this overlay of where the camera is focusing. See how it's shifted now to me. Very powerful when shooting wide open, very powerful for video, it's a favorite. And we can even designate different colors in here. So we talked about the how, we talked about the when, We've talked about the where, including the focusing clusters. We talked about back button focus. We talked about eye detection. We talked about zooming with one shot and zooming with peaking. And what I want to do now is talk about a little bit about using this for something in video work. So I'm going to flip the mode dial over to the video icon. It's going to be put us in the video mode. There's a, there are a few techniques in here that are really handy. I will demonstrate this on the crash course in real world shooting situations. We do narrative, we do interview, we do a couple different shooting styles. The first thing you're going to notice is this servo AF. If this is on, what that means is the camera is going to be focusing wherever the square is. What this also means is that if you touch on the screen, it is going to focus on that point. And there is a technique in Hollywood where they are pulling focus. Before the, the Canon 70D, we had to get all these gear wheels and rigs, 15 millimeter bars, and do this manually. The 70D Canon, it was the first one that I said, this is a game changer. Why? Because we don't need all this rig now. We can just touch on the monitor and the camera is going to shift its focus depending on where we touch. Obviously, I would turn the beep feature off if I was using this in a serious setting. But you can see it's very gradual, it's very smooth, it's nice. And this is using the touch monitor to pull focus with AF servo. So there's something important I need to point out about servo AF. If we turn this off and we change the focusing square, let's say back over to this contrast thing, and I try to engage the manual focusing wheel, nothing's going to happen. This is fly-by-wire. If that switch is on AF, that means your manual gears are not going to work. So in order to use manual focus, we have to flip it over to the manual switch. And oh, it's, we've got the peaking turned on still. Let's turn that off. That's why it's, it's good to know all these different settings here. We can zoom in onto a particular area and then do manual zoom focusing. It's a very handy technique. If you can't use peaking when you're zoomed in, right? If we flip the switch back to autofocus, we can zoom out. And we can also pick different clusters, just, to, just as we did with the still mode. There's our face detection. We have eye detection for video. Very nice, Canon, really nice. We have our zones, tracking, they're all here, it's all the same, similar stuff. As long as that servo AF is on, it's going to be focusing over and over and over again. So let's see how the tracking does. Let's turn that off, come out. We're gonna to touch over here. Yeah, not bad. Something else I, I have to point out is that the resolution that you're using may change how well this focuses, just depends. We've got a crop too, but we don't get the same dual pixel autofocus. I'm just rolling shutter in there, you can see it. See how it punched in, it's part of the crop. But in 1080, it's very impressive. Those are some focusing tips for video. We'll talk far more about this, about sports shooting and some of the problems that beginning photographers run into and how to get around them on the crash course. I'm running out of time, but I wanted to introduce you to the deep menu and at least give you a brief overview of some of the more important settings, how to navigate things of that nature. We're gonna talk about Wi-Fi, and then we'll make some lens recommendations. So the way we access the deep menu is by pressing the menu button. And you'll notice that we have these different color tabs on the top. Red is for shooting, 
Blue is for playback, we can navigate by touching as well. Yellow are your camera settings. Dark or orange are your custom settings. And the green tab is your My Menu tab. So on the crash course, we go through all of these things comprehensively, but what I wanted to share with you now were at least some of the basic and recommended settings, how to navigate. You can also get around by pushing up, down, left, right on your directional pad. I use kind of like the edge of my finger when I'm touching. I can't use the pad because I, I don't have the precision to choose between those two, for example. Some of these things we've already talked about. But this guy right here, image quality, pretty important because this is going to allow us to determine how the files are saved to the memory card. We can designate RAW or JPEG. I'll share more information with you about this on the crash course. We talked about crop aspect ratio. Image review is how long the images are showing after playback. Release shutter without card. Lens aberration correction. The gist of this is that we the lens has a profile in terms of its performance. It shares that profile with the camera and the camera can then clean up lens errors such as distortion, vignetting, things of that nature. Very cool. More important for video filmmakers, in my opinion, because we can clean up stills pretty easy, a lot harder to do for video. External speed light control, we have a full speed light lesson on the crash course. I recommend getting started with a gener generic speed light and I'll walk you through all those basically how to get up, get, get shooting with it. I don't recommend changing flash settings from the camera because it starts getting confusing, but we'll cover that on the course. Exposure compensation we talked about, but something we didn't talk about was bracketing. Bracketing tells the camera to take multiple images and to change the exposure between each of them. And to access this, you're going to open your AEB setting and you're going to rotate your primary selector wheel. You get these little tick marks breaking off. And what this is telling us, as in this example, it's going to take three images, two stops underexposed, an even exposure, and then plus two stops. And so the idea of bracketing is if we were running out of time on a shoot and we weren't exactly sure how to get the exact setting or we're shooting something like HDR, we want to merge these images together, we would use bracketing and then we would have different exposures. If you use it in conjunction with a timer, it's very handy. So another thing about this is if you're on manual mode, it will not let you shift this bracket. But if you're on aperture priority, come back in, select it. You can shift this bracket up and down different directions. It's a fun thing to try for intermediate photographers. It's something you should have in your tool bag. ISO speed settings, this is where we can change our, our ISO settings. Obviously, we can also set the range. Auto ISO has its time and place, and we can designate the minimum shutter speed. Come in here, go, if we go manual, there it is, we can designate it. Talked about a lot of these things already, auto light optimizer. Highlight tone priority. So I'm not a huge fan of this because I don't like surrendering control to the camera. And especially this particular version of it, we can get more noise and shadows. So I leave it off. The metering timer is how long our metering set settings will be displayed on the monitor. Exposure simulation is something I definitely recommend leaving on as a beginner. That allows us to preview the shot and give us an idea of what the exposure is going to be like. White balance, uh, just a different place to select it. We talked about custom white balance. We talked about white balance shifting. Color space, for most of us, it's going to be sRGB, unless we're shooting for a magazine and we know why we want Adobe RGB. Just leave it here. Picture styles we've talked about, we can customize them in here. And we can even come into user defined. I'll be showing you how to do that on the course. You can come in and customize it the way you want. For now, standard or auto, probably a good idea. Long exposure noise reduction, anything over a second is considered long exposure and there is noise associated with this. This feature is supposed to help clean it up. High ISO, speed noise reduction. I have mine on standard. Dust delete data. I am going to show you how to clean your sensor on the crash course. That's the way to take care of it. Dust delete data is a software solution to clean up images that have 
sensor dust on those. Touch shutter we talked about. The multiple exposure mode allows us to stack images on top of each other. And the HDR mode is just like it sounds. It's a high dynamic range image. It takes multiple images, it stacks them together. Pretty fun. It's, and it's gotten better over the years. It works better with non-moving subjects, but pretty cool. Focus bracketing. I'll also be talking about this on the course. Really handy for macro photographers. It essentially allows us to tell the camera to change its focusing position between multiple points. It allows us to designate the number of shots, the increments in terms of how far apart they are. Very nice. Again, all these guys will be talking about on the crash course. Interval timer as well. This allows us to essentially have a built-in intervalometer. When we enable it, we can come into our info set. So the interval is the amount of time between each shot and the number of shots are the total number of shots. So in the past, we had to buy an intervalometer to set this up, but now it's built into the camera. Very nice. So it's going to take images at intervals. If we are on the bulb mode, whenever you see great stuff grayed off, it wants you to change a camera setting somewhere. The bulb timer, if we come in here and enable this, this allows us to adjust the exposure time so we don't have to touch and hold the camera for it to be released. So come in here, let's try it out real quick. So my hand's off the camera now and it releases on its own. Pretty straightforward. Let's turn that off. Anti-flicker we talked about. Let's get back over to the AV mode. So when we are shooting sports and we're using, let's say a high speed burst, and we don't want to lose what we're watching. Something we can do to limit this is to turn on high speed display. This is going to allow us to track a moving subject a little bit better when we're shooting multiple continuous frames. Autofocus beam firing is for speed lights. Lens electronic manual focus. This allows us to get one shot and then go to manual focus. So if we wanted to do that, that would be this. You could also use it with magnifying. A lot of other camera systems do this. So you get you would get a one shot focus and then you could rotate your manual zoom and it would punch in or we could turn it off altogether. Kind of a fun thing. Talked about a lot of this stuff already. Auto slow shutter is kind of like a safety for video shooters. I personally would just recommend turning it off. Shoot on manual and adjust your shutter speed, your aperture, your ISO as needed. So coming back into the playback, a lot of this is pretty straightforward. We can protect our images, rotate them, erase them. There's printing from the camera. We can choose images for a photo book setup. We can do some raw processing in camera. There's creative control assists. We need to have raw files, obviously. Quick control, we can create albums. We can crop. Resize, a lot of this is pretty basic. It's pretty straightforward. If we wanted to crop an image, obviously we can come in here and set how we want to crop it. Rotate the, our selector wheel. We can move where, we can crop in camera. I typically don't do a lot of processing and cropping and resizing in camera until I see it on a large monitor. That's just me. The rating, so we can select images and give them a one to five star rating. So if we wanted to give it a star rating, we hit the set button, push up or down. These ratings would be respected by Photoshop or Lightroom. So when you import them, you already have a rating on them. Very nice. We can select a range, all the images in a folder, or all the images on a card. When we're jumping between images, we can designate whether it's between 1, 10. We can specify the number that we want to jump by. We can jump by date, folder movies, stills, protected, or even the star icon covering this all in much greater detail. Playback information display. We talked about the shooting information display. If you guys remember that, we can determine the types of information being shown when we're shooting, right? The playback information display allows us to determine the information that's being shown when we're playing an image. So if you come in here, you can see all the different screens we have available for playback. 
and we can determine whether we want all nine of these to show up or not. And I personally don't need all this information when I'm playing images back. There are a few I want. Basic settings, something like that, probably enough. I don't need that. Hit OK. And so when I play back an image, I can press Info, and we're toggling through those different screens, right? So we don't need all this other information. So that's your playback information. Highlight alert, if something's overexposed, it will flash in black and white. Let's see if we can, I know I took some that were definitely overexposed. There it is. It's basically flashing anything that's overexposed, pretty standard. Auto focus point display, if this is turned on, we'll get a red overlay in terms of where we were focusing. So there it is, we get this red overlay when we play back. Playback grid is an overlay, uh, doesn't affect shooting, doesn't affect the image, it allows you just to inspect with a grid. You can also turn this on in a shooting mode. View from last scene basically allows us to see the last image that we played. If you turn this off and you shoot, we're gonna play the most recently taken image. We have the ability to magnify from the center up to 10 times. So we can turn that on, come in here. So the blue icons are here. That turns this into the magnifying glass. Push that in, we can jump in 10 times. This is where we designate that setting. Yellow tab, camera settings. A lot of this is pretty straightforward too. We can select different folders. We can create different folders. If we had multiple shoots in a day, we may have one folder for that shoot, and then we had a second folder for a different shoot. Come in here, hit OK, and that might help us organize as we're shooting. File numbering, I typically have mine set to continuous. This means that when we put a new memory card in there, it continues the numbers that it last used. Auto reset means that every time you replace a memory card, it's gonna start with 0001. And we can do a manual reset. If we come in here and hit this, it'll reset it automatically. Create a new folder. If you just hit OK. Auto rotate, I usually leave mine turned on. This tells the camera to rotate the images when we shoot in the, in the portrait orientation. So this is landscape. If we were to rotate it 90 degrees, that would be the portrait orientation. Auto rotate is going to rotate it on the camera as well as the computer. Format memory card. Anytime you put a new memory card in and you want to erase everything, including protected images, you would come in here and you would reformat it. All data is going to be lost. I usually do this only when I have two or three backups of everything important that I, that I shot previously on the card. Otherwise, I do not mess with this. So good workflow and good image management means you are always going to have two copies of whatever it is you shoot, minimum. I know some people who have three copies, preferably in different locations. So once you download your images and you back it up somewhere else, and you're confident that you have redundancy for these images, then would be the time to reformat your memory card. You don't wanna reformat your memory card if you only have one copy somewhere because if the hard drive fails, those images are going to be gone forever. The mode guide and the feature guide we turned off, those were those annoying little things that we saw every time we we turn those, the mode dial. Eco mode is a power saving mode that if your battery's getting low and you, you want the camera to automatically start trying to save juice, you would turn that on. Power saving, all preference. When you want the display to turn off, when you want the camera to turn off, when you want the viewfinder to turn off. We can change our display brightness, just coming in here and toggling this up or down. We have our date and time. We have languages. Canon has a huge range of languages that will work with the menu systems. Hopefully you're an English speaker. Video system is NTSC, unless you are somewhere that uses PAL. The touch control is very nice. I like to leave mine on. We can make it even more sensitive or turn it off altogether. The beep, truth of the matter is I turn it off once I start shooting because I think it's annoying. 
We can turn it off just for the touch, or we can turn it off altogether. We have battery info. It's a brand new battery, so it, it should be performing very high. The sensor cleaning feature tells the camera to vibrate a filter that fits over the sensor when we turn the camera off, or we can automatically do it when it's on or off, or we can just turn it off altogether. We can designate it to clean now. The HDMI resolution, which is essentially a, a signal that runs out through an HDMI cable, we have that port on the side of our camera, we can have it be auto or 1080p. This HDMI HDR output is for compatible HDR monitors, otherwise it doesn't really matter. We do have HDR video, remember in that video mode, so that can come into play if your monitor will play nice with it. Shooting info display we talked about. Viewfinder preference, whether you want it to be power saving or you want it to be things displayed a little bit more quickly, if you're a sports shooter maybe. Viewfinder display format, we talked about that. Display settings, we also talked about that. Shutter button for movies. So if you're in the video mode, what do you want the shutter button to do? Halfway to press, you can meter, auto servo, one shot autofocus, or metering only. We can determine the size of the help text. We're going to be talking about Wi-Fi in just a second. I'm going to give you a special lesson on it. GPS can also be imported from either a GPS receiver or your smartphone. I don't recommend doing it from your smartphone just because of the battery drain, but there are compatible GPS receivers we can get that will log GPS information into your images. Pretty cool. We're going to be coming back to this in just a second. Last page of the yellow tab. We have this multi-function lock, this little lock switch that's up here right next to the rear control wheel. This is going to allow us to lock different features depending on what we have selected in here. This is really up to you. We have both our main dial and our secondary quick control wheel. We have the touch screen. And we also have the control ring on the lens. So if you, if you want to lock any of those, you would designate them here and push the lock switch up. Custom shooting modes we talked about when we were talking about exposures, we can clear those settings. We can add copyright information. If I wanted to put my name in here, Michael the Maven, hit OK. That would embed my name. I could add my copyright details if I wanted to. If you want to download the manual and you have a QR scanner, you can scan this and get that information. We have certification displays. They don't do anything. This is talking about electronic logo displays. Firmware version. After a certain amount of time, Canon will often issue a firmware update, which is the software for the camera. This allows us to know which version of software is on the camera or the lens that we're using. The way this works is that we download it to our SD memory card, put it into the camera, and when we come in here, the, the, it will recognize that it has the new firmware and will update it. Typically, you want to have a fully charged battery to make sure it doesn't die during update. Very common, and I am hopeful Canon will take off the restriction on using EF lenses with the adapter for 1080 video. That's something that I hope for. It's something I think they should do. I think they will do it at some point. So when we're talking about the orange tab, there are only two settings that I recommend for most beginners to change in here. For the sake of time, I'm just going to jump cut to the chase. The Orange tab breaks down the custom functions into exposure, autofocus, and operation. And on the first tab, I don't recommend changing any of these. I think they're pretty good. One thing you should be aware of is changing the number of bracketed shots. That's your number five. I'm not a huge fan of safety shift. Pretty straightforward. In the second tab, number six, I recommend changing the separate autofocus point to one. All this is saying is that when you are using landscape, when you're shooting horizontally, you're gonna have a focusing point. And then when you rotate the camera horizontally or the portrait mode, you can have a different focusing point and the camera will remember as you move the camera back and forth. It's a very useful little thing if you're doing a portrait shoot, for example. Everything else in here, I think the default setting is pretty good. We have the ability to change our autofocus sensitivity if you wanted to do that. The acceleration, deceleration, point switching, 
I don't recommend changing these for beginning and intermediate photographers, but if you get into sports shooting and you're not getting the responsiveness that you want, you can come in here and change those things. Clusters, we can determine which ones appear or not. In custom function three, the only one I recommend changing is the last one, that's your audio compression. When you have audio compression on, we're giving the camera permission to reduce the file size had a loss of quality and I'm not a fan of that so I turn it off. And, and the rest of these in here have to do with the operation of the camera, the control ring. A lot of this is preference, how things rotate, you know, your focus ring, your control ring, your dial direction, those are the first three. You know, the sensitivity when you're using manual focus, we can customize the buttons, but again, we can do this from the Q screen, the black info information screen. When we come out to the camera, come here, press Q, and we can customize these buttons. Stills on the left, video on the right. If we wanted to customize our dials, we have the, the ability to customize our control ring. This is where you would do that. But I think this is easier accessed on the black info screen using the Q menu. I know a lot of photographers who like to do ISO, for example, for the control ring. It's really up to you. But the gist of it is, when we are in the orange menu, we're not customizing a lot of things. So we have the ability to clear all of our custom functions, and we can also clear the buttons and dials. A little bit confusing, so we got custom functions and then buttons and dials, and that's our orange tab. My menu tab is super handy. This is going to allow us to designate our favorites into a tab. So we're gonna add a tab here, hit okay. Let's configure this. Select items to register. The, the ones that I use are really like format, quality, things of that nature. So basically you just come in here, image quality, hit okay. Let's find format, there it is, format card. Hit okay. And what this is going to do is it's going to add those items to our My Menu tab. Here they are right here. So the idea is that if I only use two or three things in the menu, I shouldn't have to go through the whole menu to find them. I could just add them to this green tab here, right? And there they are. I don't have to go looking for them. We can also do things such as sorting them if we wanted to change the order, no problem. Just highlight it and move it. We can also delete our items. We can delete every item on a tab, we can delete tabs, and we can remove tabs. So you can have multiple tabs, more than one. So you, see here, there they are. You could have several of them if you wanted to. Real quick, I need to point out that some of the menu items change when we are shooting on video mode. So if you flip it over to video mode and you hit menu, something you're going to notice, so when we come back to the first tab, some things have changed. We now have shooting modes. There's our HDR video. We have our resolution including 4K. We can crop movie. Some of these things we have seen before. We have this new feature, time-lapse movie. That's something we cover on the crash course, how to make a time-lapse movie. We have remote control, and that's about it. Those are just the ones I wanted to point out. So in any event, that is a quick overview of the deep menu system. We will do a comprehensive review on the crash course. So let's start talking about how to connect with our camera by Wi-Fi to our smartphone app. I'm going to use an iPhone 10 as an example. And in order for this to happen, we have to come into our menu, wireless communication settings. We have some settings for the Wi-Fi. If we want a password or connection history, but we want this Wi-Fi function right here. The camera is asking us to identify our Canon RP with a nickname. I'm gonna just type in MM for Michael the Maven. Hit okay. So after we give it a nickname, the camera is asking what we want to connect to. We want a smartphone, but there's other options for computer, printer, cloud. Let's go to the smartphone. Let's register a device for connection. It's gonna be iOS with a QR code if we wanna use that. And basically, what this is doing is it's turning the camera into a Wi-Fi point. So let me get my phone set up and I'll demonstrate the rest of this. So once we have our camera set up with our Wi-Fi, 
we're going to come into our smartphone settings, we're going to come to Wi-Fi, and we're going to look for this new network. Here it is, EOS RPMM. We're going to select that, and it's asking us to turn, type in this password that we're seeing right here. We can turn that off in our Wi-Fi settings if we want. This is a little bit more secure. We're going to join. Obviously, we need to have the Canon Connect app downloaded to our phone. Here it is, I already have the Canon Connect app on my phone. Here's the camera, we're going to select that. Once we hit that, we come over here, we hit OK. They're getting to know each other, becoming friends, and we're in business. Once we're finally connected, there are two major features that you're going to want to know about. The first is viewing the images on our camera. So I like this particular setting because it gives us the date, it gives us the time, aperture, ISO, shutter speed, exposure compensation. We can adjust how these are viewed by toggling on these different grids. We can view by date, if that was something we wanted to do. When we select the image, we can toggle the information on or off. We can also give it a star rating. So if you were shooting and you had your camera in your bag and you wanted to preview the images and start rating them, you could. You could download the image to your smartphone that quick. We can send it to a printer if we wanted to, or we can delete it. So lots of cool stuff we can do in here. We also have some settings where we can determine whether it's a smaller file size or the original size, or we can select that when we're saving. You know, when we're posting to social media, we don't need the full size, so a lot of us are okay with using reduced, and you can post to Instagram. Delete information location, I think, is a pretty good idea if you're using the GPS settings. This strips the GPS data from the images if you do not want those embedded. So just be careful with who you share those with. The movie quality, we can go compressed or original. Obviously, compressed is going to be much smaller when we're saving. Okay. But the real magic in this app is in the remote view shooting. So this is going to allow us to shoot remotely, like remote control with a preview. I use this all the time. We can change the position of our focusing square. You can hear it focusing, the beep, green square designated. If that's not working, we can slide this auto focus over. It'll take a picture when we get it over the shutter button. We can take a look at the image we just shot. It's very cool. Come back out. If you notice, we can touch on the shutter speed. We can change our, our shutter speed by touching and dragging. All remote, very nice. We have our aperture control. We have our ISO control. Touch it again. We have white balance. We can change the focusing cluster we're using. We can change our drive modes. We can adjust our focus manually, forward and backward, if we wanted to. If we didn't want to see this information, we could toggle the camera settings. Up here we have, again, some more options. Show the autofocus button. Perform bulb shooting with a long tap on certain supported cameras. We can also get, come into the video shooting mode. How awesome is this? So if we wanted to start and stop video recording, oh, we're in 4K, we don't want 4K. Let's just say, let's go 1080, 30 frames, and there we go. So if we record a video, here it comes. Very nice to be able to do this. We even get audio levels. It's, it's definitely improved over time. So if you want to download movies, you would come out here to images. Here they are. They're MP4 files. You select the one you want, download, and that is going to download this video file to your smartphone. So that was something we couldn't do for a long time, but now we have the ability to download movies as well as stills. Coming back out to the main menu, we have some other options up here. We can name the smartphone that we're connected to. 
auto transfer. So we can automatically transfer our images. If this is turned on, we can determine whether the size is reduced or not. We can strip out the GPS information. The location data, the way this works is that we set this up to work with our phone. So we have a GPS chip in our phone. And when we take a picture, it's going to pull the GPS data from our phone and embed it to the file. I'm not a huge fan of this for power reasons, but this is also privacy reasons. So I leave it turned off, but it's there if you want it. So that's an overview of Canon's Camera Connect app, how we connect to it, some of the features involved, including inspecting images, downloading them, changing our exposure settings for both stills as well as videos. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. So when we're talking about accessories for our Canon RP, there's a limited number of lenses currently available in terms of native R mount lenses. And I think 24 to 105 F4, this is a great general purpose lens. I know it's a little expensive, but it's a very high quality lens. That being said, Canon has announced six new R mount lenses. They have not been released. We don't know prices, but my guess is they're probably going to be pretty expensive. <laughs> So with that said, I think the EF to R mount adapter is a must have. Why? Because there's a huge number of Canon EF compatible lenses out there that are going to allow us to get access to some really good quality glass at an affordable price. That said, I would really strongly recommend the 85 millimeter 1.8 as a beginning portrait lens. That's a good focal length. Canon also makes a 50 millimeter 1.8 for about $110 far more affordable. And there is a knockoff version of that lens made by a company called Yunguno for less than 50. That's a very tough value to beat. The number one accessory, I believe, after you have your basic lens set up is a tripod. I am a big fan of the carbon fiber tripods. Bogan Manfrotto makes one called the Be Free. You can get it with a locking ball head. Mi Photo also has some comparable tripods. I'm not a huge fan of the ones you can you see in Walmart for 40 or 50 bucks. I think they're a little bit flimsy and just because of the weight of the camera and the weight of the lens over time, it's going to break down and I think it's a little bit risky. You can make it work if you have nothing else, but I do not recommend the flimsy tripod. Spend a little bit of money and get a good carbon fiber one. It's going to allow you to do things like landscape, group photography, uh, obviously for video work long exposures. Tripods are amazing. If you do any kind of high-end video work, you're going to want to get an external microphone. Rode makes a number of great onboard hot shoe microphones that you can plug into the side of the camera. I will teach you how to clean up the audio and make it sound great, but if you're doing any kind of video work, that is a must-have. If you have a little bit more money to spend, I am a big fan of Canon's Trinity lenses. We're talking about the 16 to 35 2.8, the 24 to 70 2.8, and the 70 to 200 2.8. And there are different versions of those. Obviously the version three for the 16 to 35 and the 70 to 200 are the best that Canon makes. That said, there are some really good version twos out there. I use the 24 to 70 2.8 version two. It's a little bit expensive but that is a great lens. I mean, we could talk about lenses all day in, in terms of what you can get, but I'm just saying those are some of the higher end lenses. If you're interested in, in purchasing some of the gear that I've mentioned, if you go to my blog where we have this video posted, you'll see all those links below the video. And I also have a tab on my blog that has everything in terms of every camera body, every lens, and all of my gear recommendations. That being said, again, the most valuable investment that you can make is right here between your ears, it's the knowledge and information. So if you found this video helpful and you gained some benefit from it and you'd like to continue your education shooting with the Canon RP, check out the Canon RP crash course. Should be ready in a couple weeks. If you follow the link in the description, just leave your name and we will contact you as soon as it's ready. Thank you for watching and I will see you on the crash course. Have a good one.